Morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 23rd of July. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 26th of July, with me, Michael Hewson. And it's certainly been a week of downs and then ups. And certainly, I think when we look back at the events of the last few days, I don't think we're really any the wiser when it comes to where markets are likely to go to next. We got off to um, a bad start to the week, um, largely, I think, over concerns about rising Delta um, variant infection rates, slowing down, slowing down the, uh, the, the, the economic recovery. But I think as we move past the summer into the autumn and the winter, there was always an expectation, certainly on my part, that we would probably see a little bit of a slowdown in some of the economic numbers, particularly I think when you think about the fact that as as the weather gets colder, everyone will move inside. And ultimately, I think the real concern isn't so much rising infection rates, it's rising hospitalizations. And obviously, um, tragically, you know, a higher death rate. But I think once once you look past some of the headline risks, and I think an awful lot of this week's sell-off was as a consequence of headline risk and concerns about uh, lower growth, lower earnings expectations. Markets are caught in a little bit of a pincer movement at the moment between rising inflation expectations and potentially lower growth, and not really too sure how to balance that risk profile. I think that that's no better borne out in the way that the US 10-year yield has behaved so far this week, where we've seen um, significant drops in the level of the US 10-year Treasury yield. And we can see that um, from this chart here. If we look year to date, we've seen pretty much yields peak all the way back in March. They've been slowly rolling over, slowly rolling over, slowly rolling over. And we've hit a low of 1.126 earlier this week. Now, we've since rebounded um, on the back of that. And I think a large part of the reason for that rebound is that while the markets are potentially pricing lower inflation risk, I think there is another narrative at play here. Ultimately, they're probably not pricing in the prospect of lower prices, but lower growth. And I think that's where the narrative starts to get a little bit, bit blurry. But I think looking past the narrative and looking at the price action, I think as long as you look at the price action, you've probably got a better idea of where markets are likely to go over the course of the next few weeks and months. And I think it's very important sometimes to try and divorce yourself from the narrative, the news narrative, the headline risk, and actually look at what prices are doing more broadly. And I think, you know, while we can look at the fact that the FTSE 100 hit a three month low earlier this week, what we didn't do is we didn't take out this 6805 level, which has been on my chart pretty much um, for the last two to three months. Um, you know, these the series of highs through 86, 6800, 6805, we haven't as yet broken below what I would categorize as a fairly important pivot level. And yes, we did break this trend line here. That provoked a very sharp move lower. But what I think was, was very important was the fact that we didn't take out that support level there, which obviously neatly brings us back pretty much where we started the week. So, you know, if you've basically gone into an under, underground bunker on Friday last week and resurfaced this week, We've gone nowhere, <laughs> you know, and you think, well, what's all the fuss about? But I think it is important to understand the narrative did change a little bit this week, but ultimately, um, all it's done is introduce volatility as opposed to a change in direction. Um, and I think that more that, that is more important than anything else in terms of takeaways. Now, obviously, we had the European Central Bank rate meeting earlier this week, in fact, yesterday where 
Christine Lagarde, president of the ECB, um, outlined um, the central bank's new guidance tools. Um, didn't really provide too much in the way of excitement. Uh, once again, Christine Lagarde talks a lot without saying very much. Uh, the new four guidance, I think, really, I think merely outlined the fact that the ECB was likely to be ultra accommodative for a long time to come, you know, until the middle of the decade, I would suggest. And I think the new guidance really was, I think, if, you, if I could describe it as anything, it's the equivalent of giving a rather battered old car a new paint job, a quick engine tune up. It looks nicer, but it's still the same old banger underneath. Um, so that brings us on to the events for this coming week. And we've got an absolutely busy week ahead of us in terms of earnings and um, central bank meetings. So rather than digress and prattle on any more, um, let's really get into the guts of that. But I think more than anything else, I think whatever we hear next week, it's probably not going to change the overall direction for markets more broadly. But I certainly think in terms of the FTSE 100, we're still in this 6,800 range, 7,200 range that we've been in pretty much since the beginning of April, um, April, April, May. And for me, it's going to be very, very difficult to really sort of ascertain what's going to drive us out of that range, given some of the weaker data that we've seen this week, the flash PMIs from the UK, services in particular was um, much softer than expected, coming in at 57.4 and dropping below 60 for the first time in several months. And I think a large part of that can be down to some of the impact of the self-isolation rules um, of the NHS app, which has forced ordinarily healthy people or potentially healthy people to self-isolate because they've been pinged by the app. Now, the government is relaxing some of the rules around that. An awful lot of people are actually removing the app from their phones um, rather, than have, rather than having the risk of you know, their, their life being disrupted. And some people haven't even downloaded it at all. I mean, me, myself, I don't have it on my phone. Um, and that's not to say that I'm reckless in terms of who I associate with and who I don't. I'm just very, very careful um, about where I go and what I do. I don't want the government tracking me, um, whatever your views on the Track and Trace app. And obviously, there are also concerns about potentially false positives and um, other such indications. But I'm digressing ever so slightly. Let's look at the markets for next week. Look at the DAX again fell very, very sharply to a two-month low. But I think more importantly, we didn't make lower lows. And I think that more than anything is the most important factor when it comes to looking at the way the markets are trading. We've been very, very choppy over the course of the past few weeks. And that's no better borne out by these daily candles here. Um, up one day, down the next, up one day, down, 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 and then up, up, up. So, But more broadly, we're still respecting the overall range that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks. And while central banks are likely to remain accommodative, it's hard to see where the next big sell-off is coming from. And that's not to say it won't happen, but I think trying to get in in front of it, particularly in these markets, is a very dangerous thing to do. You have to trade what you see. And at the moment, what we're seeing is volatility, albeit within a fairly broad range. And all the global markets that we're looking at here are still very much in the uptrend they've been in pretty much since those lows that we saw in March 2020. You know, and that's no better borne out by the S&P 500 here. I mean, look at this trend line that I've drawn here. 50-day um, moving average again. Um, you know, the, the price action has never really deviated that much away from the 50-day the moving average pretty much since March last year. You know, you can draw a series of lines in. We're getting progressively higher lows and higher highs. That is symptomatic of an uptrend. And the big test will be now whether or not we can push above 4,400. The NASDAQ has already made a new record high this week, despite the early week sell-offs that we saw on Monday. So, you know, once again, the trend is your friend. 
And that more than anything is the important takeaway, I think, when it comes to looking at what's coming up next week. Um, and the main item that I have my eye on is the Fed rate meeting. Um, and I think that is important. This is the last meeting before the Jackson Hole Annual Symposium at the end of August. And that's generally, I think, when we will hear whether or not the Federal Reserve is inclined to think about a tapering of its um, bond buying program. Now, I think when we look back to the events on Monday and the little bit of a growth scare that we had on Monday, talk of tapering asset purchases sort of seems rather out of kilter when you have concerns about a growth slowdown. And you certainly, I think there's certainly an argument to be said that we may have seen peak bounce back when it comes to the rebound in the global economy. Uh, we've got US Q2 GDP numbers coming out on the 29th of July, the day after the Fed rate meeting. So we've got the Q2 GDP coming out on Thursday. We've got the Fed rate meeting on the Wednesday. We've also got US consumer confidence on the Tuesday. So, you know, what, what, what are we going to be looking at in particular when it comes to the US numbers next week? And we've also got US personal spending and income on the Friday. So let's deal with each of these in turn. Consumer confidence managed to hit a post-pandemic peak in June of 127.3. So the big question for the July consumer confidence is whether or not consumer confidence reflects accurately the personal spending US retail sales numbers. And you've got to you've got to ask yourself, it doesn't really, because US retail sales numbers have been fairly patchy up one month down the next. And they've also been skewed enormously by the various stimulus check payments that US consumers have been on the receiving end of this year once in January and again in March. And I think one of the things that I think the spending patterns have taught us is that, or are teaching, you know, telling me is that US consumer, while outwardly confident in terms of the consumer confidence numbers, is still a little bit cautious when it comes to spending money as we head towards the autumn. And I think that's likely to be borne out in the Q2 GDP numbers. You know, in terms of GDP, we saw the US economy expand by 6.4% in the first quarter. Now, the spillover effects of this are still going to ripple over into Q2. And as such, we could we are expecting to see an annualized 8% rebound in Q2 with personal consumption once again driving it, but also some fairly decent numbers out of the manufacturing sector. But, but you know, stripping all of that aside, um, personal spending and income also tell us that um, the US consumer is still probably saving more money than they're spending. So more broadly, I think the key takeaway for me next week is not so much the data, which is likely to continue to be patchy, but still point to a US economy that's doing fairly well, um, albeit with weekly jobless claims that are continuing to decline, but are also prone to the occasional spike but also to a Fed rate meeting, which is likely to see a significant uplift or upgrade to the discussions around the timing around the tapering of asset purchases. Because if we look back at the last meeting, one of the key takeaways for that, it almost seems counterintuitive that we've seen a number of Fed members start to talk in terms not only of tapering, which is going to come at some point, you would imagine, but also in terms of a 2022 rate hike. Now, talk of a rate hike, given what we've seen and the concerns that we've seen this week, seems a bit daft, particularly in terms of the sharp rise in Delta variant cases that are not only being seen um, here in the UK, but also in Asia, as well as in the US. And people are talking about these rising Delta cases being um, the um, symptom of, you know, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. But that's not to say that even if you're vaccinated, you can't get the Delta variant. The difference is it's less likely to hospitalise you, not the fact that you're less likely to get it. And I think that is more than anything the key. So some of fears over inflation have already started to subside in bond markets. We've seen commodity prices start to soften. 
um, specifically uh, copper prices, nickel prices, um, oil prices as well come off their highs. We saw a big decline earlier this week. Lumber prices are pretty much halved from their peaks. They're still at elevated levels, but they're certainly half the level they were previously. So, you know, there are concerns that the global recovery may well be weaker than was anticipated when everyone was getting really bullish all the way back in March. So I'll be very interested to see what the narrative is that Jay Powell talks about when it comes to any potential discussions, shall we say, about the timing or otherwise or a tapering of asset purchases. We've also got German IFO business confidence numbers um, the coming week. I think these will be interesting in the context of the awful floods that we've seen in Europe and whether or not German businesses see significant disruption as a consequence of that. Um, those numbers are out on the 26th of July, which sort of brings me on to the earnings numbers for this week. And there's a whole load of them. You can see them on my list here. We've got Tesla, which I was, hope, I was thinking was going to happen this week, but ultimately the numbers got pushed and they are now due out on the 26th of July. We've also got UK banks, Barclays, Lloyd, Lloyds, and NatWest. And we've also got some key tech numbers from Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft. So um, let's start with the UK banks, because we've we, one of the takeaways that I think we've, we've taken away from the recent US bank earnings has been the fact that fixed income has been a little bit of a drag. And I expect that to continue to be the case for Barclays, um, particularly when they release the numbers on the 28th. Um, since the numbers that we saw in Q1, the uh, Barclays share price has drifted lower. Um, so that pretty much was the peak when it comes for the Barclays share price, the highest level since December 2009. And Barclays has been one of the outperformers when it comes to the UK banking sector. So we've seen a little bit of a slowdown. So I think expectations around that are going to be slightly tempered. So in light of the reaction to recent Q2 numbers in the US, I think we're likely to see a similar pattern play out with the Barclays numbers. Um, we saw fix, you know, we saw misses across the board. So we'll probably see something similar for Barclays. Equities trading did well in Q1. So I'll be looking for something similar in Q2. Uh, we'll also be looking to see if there is decent demand for loans as an indicator of the strength of the recovery story for the UK economy as businesses start to reopen in the second quarter of this year. So key levels for me on Barclays are going to be 158p and the 200 day moving average. OK, so that brings us on to Lloyd's Banking Group. Again, see, they seen some decent gains um, thus far. Uh, we can look at the trend line here that's currently in place. Don't think we really need this line now. It's completely redundant. So let's just chop it out. Um, look at the similar sort of narrative playing out with respect to the Lloyd's numbers that we saw. Um, in Q1, unlike Barclays, um, Lloyd shares actually went higher in the aftermath of the Q1 earnings numbers, hitting 15-month highs all the way back here in May. Still haven't completely recovered our uh, pre-pandemic or post-pandemic losses, but nonetheless making fairly decent progress. I think in terms of the housing market, loan demand again will probably be a key indicator here. Um, mortgages is a very, very key part of Lloyd's and to a lesser extent NatWest's business model going forward. So I think loan de the loan demand story will be quite significant. And I think another thing to keep an eye out for um, over the course of this earnings season is loan loss reserves. Um, Barclays, NatWest and Lloyd's set aside quite a bit of provision when it comes to non-performing loans. I think it'll be very notable and interesting to see whether or not they add some of that back, given the fact that the UK economy has performed quite a bit better uh, than anticipated, even though we are starting to see a, see a, see a little bit of a, a pandemic slowdown. 
Um, Barclays didn't release any of its loan loss reserves in um, April. Lloyd's did. So it'll be interesting to see what the, um, the dynamic is there with respect to loan loss reserves with respect to Barclays when they report uh, next week. Um, in terms of margins, net interest margins for Lloyd's is one of the best in the UK banking sector. So we'll be certainly looking to see whether or not that is improved going forward. Expectations around Q2 um, prof statutory profits. Um, the expectation is that probably coming in around about 1 to 1.2 billion for Q2. Um, optimism, I think, over the second half could be tempered by recent events. And obviously, the economic picture looks less certain as we head into the back end of the year. But certainly, I think on a valuation basis, um, and you look at where Lloyd's is now and where it was all the way back there, it's still quite, I've got a lot of ground to catch up and it has started to pay a dividend again. So, you know, you, you pay your money, you take your choice, but you certainly look at this chart here. And even though we are in a bit of a short term downtrend, I think as long as we can hold above these lows back in April, then um, the outlook continues to look positive for Lloyd's. Net West, similar sort of story, struggling to get through 211, 212. Obviously, last week there was a story that the the um, UK government is looking to pare down. It's now 54% stake in NatWest. And more broadly, I think in terms of um, the overall outlook when it comes to NatWest, the same, the same sort of dynamics apply when it comes to um, the, the tests that we um, assign to Lloyd's. So for me, I think the key support level on NatWest is through these lows here. We can just draw that line in there. So 184.75, keep a very close eye on that. Expectations of the consumers to spend more as lockdown restrictions end. Demand for mortgages, other loans and credit card spending are likely to be key because one of the one of the other takeaways from Q1 was the fact that both NatWest and Lloyd's saw an increase in customer deposits. So it'll be interesting to see whether that level drops and whether the spending increases. So that's UK bank numbers for next week, and uh, which then moves us neatly on to the US. Now, brief, brief mention that Robin Hood's IPO is due to hit the tape 29th of July next week. Those are the early indications. I have written a little bit of a missive on the Robin Hood IPO. We can see that you can find that here. And as I say, that is expected to go live on um, on Thursday of next week. Okay, so let's move on to the US numbers and Tesla, our old favorite Tesla. Now, this is a really good line that I've drawn in here. It's from the March lows of last year. And we've already seen, we've already heard from Tesla that um, deliveries, deliveries in Q2 um, came in at 201,250 vehicles. Um, that was short of expectations, but it was still the first time that Tesla had pushed above the 200,000 mark for quarterly deliveries. Um, the new Model S also accelerated in Q2. And I think more importantly than anything else, I think the big thing, as far as I'm concerned, is whether or not the decline that we've seen in operating margins has stopped and actually whether or not Tesla is starting to make money when it comes to selling its cars, because at the moment, the only thing it makes money on is carbon credits and obviously is exposure to Bitcoin, which does appear to have found a little bit of a base around that 30,000 level. So, um, and also there's the fact that what are, what are Chinese sales looking like? Look, looking, what are they looking like? Because um, the China love affair appears to be souring a little bit for uh, Elon Musk. There's been uh, a number of, how shall we say, setbacks when it comes to China. There's a Chinese regulator ordered the company to fix a safety issue and all of the cars sold there due to a problem 
that means the car's autopilot can be enabled remotely. Now this would require a fix on over 285,000 vehicles, which is likely to be costly. So I'd be interested to see what Tesla has to say about that. Um, they've held up reasonably well the quarter, the shares, the share price, but this level that we're approaching here is likely to be a fairly key one. It's sort of trading rather messily around the 200 day moving average. We break this trend line, we could see a sharp move lower. We've also got numbers from Apple and uh, expectations there are very, very elevated. Um, as we can see, this week's volatility has pulled the share price around quite a bit over the course of the past few days. And there's the fact that um, they've, they've released a whole host of new operating system upgrades, including iOS 15, Watch OS 8, a new health app, a host of new features for Apple TV, HomePod Mini, and what have you. So expectations are for double digit growth for this quarter. Chip shortages may play into the sale of their new 5G iPhone. Certainly they may have been late to the party when it comes to that, but certainly the numbers have been playing fairly decent catch up. So be interesting to see whether or not we crack through 150 next week going forward. Uh, Amazon.com, similar sort of story with respect to that. It's been one of the big gainers from the shift to home working. We can see that here again, the trend is very much your friend. Yes, the oscillator is pointing down, but these lows are continuing to get higher. So in terms of the outlook for Amazon, um, it's ramping up its prime video offering and an attempt to take on Netflix. Um, spending apparently spending 500 million dollars on a new lord of the rings tv series apparently is amazon and obviously it's also just acquired mgm studios for nine billion dollars though there is apparently some um, investigation into that in terms of its q2 sales forecast amazon was bullish so we're expecting somewhere between 110 billion and 116 billion dollars with profits expected to come in around about 12 dollars 20 per share um finishing off with microsoft again there's a common theme here isn't there that's hit new record highs yesterday at around about the same time as uh the nasdaq hit a new record high and it's a big quarter for microsoft as it looks to round off a record year for the business it's been able to post two successive quarters of over $40 billion. Profits, $14.8 billion from the, from Q3, 38% rise from the previous year. Productivity, cloud computing, workplace subscription services, Xbox gaming consoles, huge demand for PCs. I could go on when it comes to Microsoft. So I think in terms of where we look next, um, yeah, the key the key support on the on the Microsoft um, on the Microsoft uh, share price is back down here at around about the Monday lows, which was around about two seventy five. And of and and of course, not forgetting of course, Windows eleven. What what does Microsoft have to say about the new Windows eleven and the upgrade path there? So that's what's coming up next week. Just quickly take you, take you quickly through some of the trends when it comes to the pound. Still very much in a downtrend. Found a little bit of support around here. Starting to edge back, edge back a little bit towards the upside, but we can see from here, sterling continues to remain in a sideways trend. What was critical about today's weakness or this week's weakness in the pound was the fact that we didn't take out um, this 135.70 area, which also happened to be the February lows. Um, it also, if we zoom all the way out, it's a fairly key fib level from this entire move from the lows that we saw back in 2020 to the peaks that we saw earlier this year. It's 23.6 Fibonacci retracement level of this move here, but it also coincides with a much broader 
fib level from all the way back 2008 to the lows here. So we've got a fairly key level there and a fairly key level there. So 135.70, when we look at the cable, is a fairly key level when it comes to this long term down move fib retracement there. But also, if we drill in a little bit further, it also acted as a fairly key level in and around here, as well as being the 50 week moving average support. So we've identified a fairly key support level on cable 135.70, 135.140 is probably on the wide of it. And then we have Euro Sterling, which continues to trade in the broad range that it's been in over the course of the past few months, three months to be precise. And I don't think that is probably going to change too much over the course of the next few weeks, though my bias is for a slightly stronger pound and a slightly weaker euro. OK, so um, I think that's pretty much I think that's pretty much it for this week's weekly market update. I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. Um, speak to you all at the same time same place next week and all have a great weekend thanks very much for listening <laughs>